Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the session, Pulmonologists as the Gatekeepers of Precision Medicine, How Much is Enough Tissue? So uh, my name is Momin Wahidi. I'm an interventional pulmonologist at Duke University Medical Center. I have the pleasure of, of having Dr. Dean Wallace here, pathologist with interest in lung pathology, who is the Chief of Pulmonary Pathology at UCLA. And today's learning objective is really to talk about the current uh, guidelines pertaining to adequate tissue acquisition and its implication in non-small cell lung cancer, and also recognize the importance of obtaining adequate tissue samples for the diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer, including molecular analysis. All right, let's start with a case and uh, some questions. A 50-year-old male smoker has the following CT scan. You can see here the CT. A PET scan shows FDG uptake in the nodule in the right upper lobe, as well as the 4R lymph node or the right paratracheal lymph node. Which of the following should be performed? Transthoracic needle aspiration of the nodule, EBUS TBNA of 4R, VATS with wedge resection of the nodule, repeat PET scan in three months. Please answer now. And the following biomarkers are recommended for the ancillary testing panel for advanced non-small cell lung cancer, except EGFR, AL, KRAS, and ROS1. Which one you would not obtain for advanced non-small cell lung cancer? Let's start with the clinical case. This is a patient in your clinic, Carl. Carl is 62-year-old. He smoked a 50-pack year. He presents with shortness of breath and scan hemoptysis. A chest x-ray showed left lower lobe nodule. And a CT scan did confirm that left lower, uh, left lower lobe nodule. We got a, a PET scan, and we actually have also mediastinal lymphadenopathy. The PET scan showed that there's uptake in this left lower lobe nodule, as well as an uptake in the mediastinum. We have it in uh, level 5 and 6, 4R, uh, 7 is not shown here, the subcarinal, as well as 11L, the interlobar uh, infrahylar lymph node. So we have a lot of activities in this patient in the mediastinum and hyalur area. So the suspicion for lung cancer is very high in this patient, right? He smoked 50 pack year history. We have a lung nodule, a mediastinum, hyalur lymph node. You're trying to do, you're, you're planning and thinking about a bronchoscopy, and you're thinking about these questions. What side should I sample first when sampling my target? How can I obtain the best specimen, sufficient quantity, and superior quality? These are the two things that we have to make sure to do today when we sample tissue for suspicion of lung cancer. So what's the best sampling approach for this patient? Do you want to do a CT guided biopsy of the left lung nodule? Do you want to do EBUS tBNA of the left hyalur lymph node? VATS resection of the left lung nodule? or EBUS guided TVNA of the right paratracheal lymph node? All right, so 69% of you said, let's sample that right paratracheal lymph node, and about 25% said, let's go after that lung nodule and get tissue with a transthoracic needle aspiration. And the correct answer is four, is to go after the contralateral lymph mediastinal lymph node. We'll go over the staging for these patients, some of the strategies for staging and sampling. So it's important for us to remember the stages of lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, and why they matter. They matter because the survival is vastly different. You see here the survival of patients of 1A is about 59 months at five years. But look at what happens 3B, 3A, much lower survival. So it's important to give the patient the right stage so we'll know the prognosis of survival, and more importantly is to give them the adequate treatment, the appropriate treatment for their stage. As you know, 1A, 1B is usually treated with surgery. 2A, 2B is treated with surgery, but this is the category that there's evidence that adjuvant chemotherapy can improve their survival. So they get the surgery, and then they get adjuvant chemotherapy. And then 3A is sort of the last stage where maybe surgery can be offered. Most of the patients can't get surgery. Some of them get neoadjuvant chemoradiation followed by surgery. And finally, 3B and 4 is really systemic chemotherapy and radiation therapy as appropriate. So how do we do, do you think, in the United States in staging? Do we do a good job? We don't do a good job. Here's a study published in 2009 by Farage 
where they looked at multimodality staging for lung cancer among 43,000 Medicare beneficiaries. And they looked at if the patient had single modality, meaning just a CAT scan, bimodality, CAT scan plus PET scan or CAT scan plus invasive staging, and trimodality, CAT, PET, and invasive staging. And only 30% of the patient had bimodality. This is the U.S. Uh, and notice the correlation when they looked at the number of modalities used for staging with mortality and, and, and better survival. So you can see that um, if you use bi versus single modality, your risk of death was lower. If you did tri versus single, again, lower. Tri versus bi is lower. So you can see that really implementing the right staging strategy is so important for the survival of your patients. And we don't do a good job at it in the United States, at least not in 2009 when we published this, up to 2005. I'm hoping the last decade that we've made stride in that area. So when you see a patient like Carl, how do you decide what to do next? Well, obviously, you're going to do a very thorough clinical evaluation. You're going to see if they have any lymph nodes, cervical, supraclavicular. Do they have uh, localized pain pointing to bone metastases, which can direct your workup? Obviously, you're going to have a chest CT. And additional imaging, like PET, is directed by the stage. When I refer to the uh, chest guidelines on lung cancer a lot in this uh, talk, but in 2013, as you know, the uh, lung cancer guidelines were updated. And the recommendation is for patients with normal clinical evaluation and no extrathoracic abnormality on chest CT, like our patient. There's no evidence of liver metastases or adrenal metastases. And they're being considered for something curative. PET imaging is recommended. Based on what you remember about that patient, clinical and radiographic data so far that I gave you. We haven't sampled yet. We know they have a left lower lobe nodule and some mediastinal lymph node on both sides. What do you think the radiographic clinical staging of this cancer is? It is sometimes hard to remember all these stages. There's, by the way, a free app called Lung Cancer Stage. It's not a plug for anybody. It's a free app. Download it. It gives you all these stages. You put the what's the size of the tumor, the lymph nodes, and it gives you a stage. It's actually a really good practice in clinic. All right, let's see what you guys said. All right, 81% of you got it right. It's 3B because it's the contralateral mediastinal lymph node that appears to be involved, the right peritracheal. Remember, the nodule is on the left, the lymph node on the right. If it's on the same side, it would have been a 3A. Contralateral side is 3B. But is that enough? Are you convinced that Carl has stage 3B based on the PET scan? Or do you want to do something more? Actually, radiographic staging alone is not enough. It could be very active on PET scan. However, we know this about CT and PET. This is accuracy of um, CT and PET in the stage of uh, non-small cell lung cancer in the mediastine. The sensitivity is 55% for CT, 77% for PET. But look at the specificity, 81 and 86%. That means you are going to have false positive. That means if there's an active lymph node on PET scan, it could be something else other than cancer. It could be infection. It could be reactive to another process. It could be sarcoid. So the burden of proof is on us to actually sample those lymph nodes and prove whether they're involved with cancer or not. And so, again, the guidelines suggest that in patients with an imaging finding suggestive of metastases that we further evaluate with tissue sampling to confirm that clinical stage prior to choosing the treatment. Now, we got to be uh, thoughtful about this. If there's overwhelming evidence of cancer, like this patient, there's pleural effusion, there's a large mass, there's lung nodules all over the place, there's an adrenal, you're not going to go after each site. This is overwhelming picture of metastatic stage 4 lung cancer. In those situations, you just go after one site to get the tissue diagnosis and adequate tissue. So how do we do invasive mediastinal staging? We can do conventional transmarkle needle aspiration. We can do ultrasound guided with EBIS, EUS. We can do mediastinoscopy. And we can do surgical uh, with VATS or thoracotomy. 
I want to quickly over, uh, go over one study, which really been a milestone study, where they compared EVIS EUS with mediastinoscopy. And this was sort of a definitive study confirming our suspicion that EBIS and EUS are as good, endobrachial ultrasound, esophageal ultrasound, are as good as mediastinoscopy. So I'll go over this quickly, but it was 241 patients with suspected cancer, and they are under mass either get mediastinoscopy or EBIS EUS. Now, if you had positive uh, cancer on EBIS EUS, it's positive, it's done. If it's negative, you went actually to um, surgery to confirm whether that EBIS or US negative was truly negative. So it was a really thoughtful approach to staging of lung cancer. And you can see that the sensitivity of finding metastases, surgical was 79%, endosonography, which is EBIS or US, was 85 And endosonography followed by surgical, meaning if it's positive, you accepted it. If it's negative by endosonography, you confirm it with surgery was the best approach, and that's what we do today. We start with the EBIS. If it's positive, those lymph nodes, that 4R, if I sampled it, it's positive, we're done. Patient stage 3B. If it's negative, I'm not so sure that I might have, maybe I missed it. And so those will go to mediastinoscopy or VATS to confirm that those lymph nodes are negative. Just show you the uh, ACCP lung cancer guidelines, third edition. In patients with high suspicion of N2 and N3 involvement on PET scan, a needle technique aspiration, either EBS, EUS, or combined, is recommended over surgical staging as the best first test. So today, the paradigm has shifted. If you have enlarged lymph nodes that are active in the mediastinum, the first step should be EBIS guided or ultrasound guided over mediastinoscopy. Now it depends on your hospital setting and who has the skills and who does EBIS versus mediastinoscopy, but this is the recommendation. This is a very important slide. I want this to be sort of memorable and that you take this with you. When we do a procedure to sample lymph nodes, you must honor this order. You go from the sampling the highest possible stage to the lowest possible stage. So you start with N3. So in Carl, I would start with 4R because it's a contralateral. That's the highest stage. If it's positive, I'm done, assuming that I have a pathology team outside telling me what my results are. And then I go to N2, which would be in, in Carl, subcarinal and left paratracheal. And then if I need to, I can go to the left hilar lymph node. Very important to honor that order. You don't want to start from low to high because you can contaminate the stage up. You can't contaminate down because if N3 is positive, it doesn't matter if N2 is positive. So I'm going to spend about five minutes or so on acquisition of adequate tissue. You've decided to do EBIS tBNA of that 4R, and now you're thinking, what needle gauge should I use? How many needle passes? And should I use rapid on-site evaluation? I want to point you to this guideline paper that we published, and I was part of it at CHEST. If you do EBIS, this is a really nice paper. We tried to summarize all the known data about EBIS as far as the practical aspects, all these questions that I showed you. And this is a really good reference. So I'm going to tackle some of these questions. When sampling mediastinal lymph nodes with EBIS tBNA, which is true about the diagnostic yield? 21 gauge needle is better than 22. 21 and 22 are equivalent. 19 gauge is the best. 25 gauge needle is the best. What do you know about the size? Does it matter if it's small, large, or medium? Majority of you got it. We actually, the size does not affect the diagnostic yield. And this is based on studies. I'll quickly go over those. You can see randomized control trials showing that People were randomized to 21 or 22 gauge, and there was no difference in the diagnostic yield or complication. And so the guideline recommended that you can use either 21 or 22 gauge, and you would have the same diagnostic yield. How about suction? So a question for you. This is just getting an idea of what you do in your practice when you sample lymph nodes. When should suction be used during EBIS tBNA? All the time, sometimes, rarely, never. What do you do today if you do the procedure? Or what do you know about it? Should you use suction or not? Most of you do sometimes, and some do all the time. And actually, that's okay, but the data suggests that actually there is no difference 
in the diagnostic yield, whether you do suction or not. This is a randomized control trial showing that when they use suction or no suction, there was no evidence of benefit, no difference in diagnosis or adequacy. And so the guidelines said, we suggest that you can do it with or without. The caveat is when I do EVIS TBNA, I start with suction. If it's too bloody, then my next pass is going to be without suction. It's uh, the idea of blood can make your sample worse. All right. What is the fewest number of EVIS TBNA needle passes that gives maximum diagnostic sensitivity? How many passes do you need to do to get that maximum diagnostic yield for lung cancer? We're talking about lung cancer. Three, five, seven, or nine. And most of you got it right. It's actually three. This is just to get a diagnosis. We'll talk about this quickly. But um, in a study done in South Korea, you can see that the sensitivity went up after one or two or three, but after three, it plateaued. So today when we do EVIS TNA, if you're just wanting to get the diagnosis, you do three passes. And a pass is a distinct entry and exit of the needle, not the 510 agitation you do every time you put the needle in. And so that's uh, the guideline recommendation, a minimum of three separate needle passes to be performed in each sampling site. Now we come to this really important area of molecular markers. Today, if you're trying to diagnose a patient with non -small, advanced non-small cell lung cancer and treat them, you can't really do them justice without knowing their marker status. You've got to know the marker status so you can give them the best treatment. And can we do that with EBIS? And how many passes do we need? The data suggests is yes, we can do it with EBIS TVNA, needle-based technique, high rate of uh, success. It's actually a range of upper 80s to maybe mid 90s. At least in one study, it's, you need at least four passes. But when we looked at all the data, you know how I told you you need three to establish a diagnosis? But you need additional passes, I'll show you this quickly, to get enough tissue for molecular markers. So at least another two or so passes that you put in cell block for the pathologist to do molecular marking. And I'll ask Dean now, this is the new reality. So we need to check these. And has that changed the way you, as a pathologist, you're approaching this? Yeah, so now when we get pieces of tissue, there's so much more testing we have to do. And so there's, we have to be much more careful with the tissue and how we handle it to preserve it as much as possible. These are uh, the most common biomarkers that we test nowadays. And this slide shows the treatments that are associated with each biomarker. When I started pathology 15 years ago, so all we said when we did a needle biopsy was non-small cell lung cancer and signed it out and went home. Nowadays, we have to give not just a very specific histologic subtype, but also pretty advanced molecular and cytogenetic studies. So EGFR is a molecular study where we look for molecular mutations. ALK and ROS1 are fish studies. And the pdl one stain is, a, is an IHC study. So ultimately, we have to be very careful with how we handle the tissue, and we'll talk about that in a second. Right. And as you might know, about two weeks ago, a big study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about PDL1, where as a first-line treatment, if the patient had PDL1 positive, if they had a specific drug, it was superior to conventional chemotherapy. So now every oncologist and every patient with non-small cell lung cancer, adenocarcinoma advanced, want to know if the patient has PDL or not. Going back to Carl, we actually did an EBIS on, we did the right paratracheal. And we just wanted to know, so how are we going to handle that tissue and, and how do we process that? And Dean will help us with that in a little bit. But, and the recommendation from the guideline is, again, you, you can do this procedure with or without rows because it doesn't improve your diagnostic yield. However, there are some benefits like potentially lessening the number of procedures you do or judging the adequacy of the tissue for molecular markers. So we're still doing rows because of those, not to help me you know, improve my diagnosis, but for the other two reasons I mentioned. In our patient, he underwent bronchoscopy with EVIS TVNA of the right paratracheal lymph node for our, the lymph node was positive for adenocarcinoma, confirming a stage 3B lung cancer. EGFR and ALK were tested and were negative. And this was a couple years ago where ROS1 and PDL were not as prominent, and Dean will talk about that. The patient received conventional systemic chemotherapy. 
So the summary of the sora pulmonologist's part obtaining tissue is you now are an active member of the team taking care of the lung cancer patient. You have the responsibility of getting that tissue. You have to know the staging of lung cancer very well. You got to obtain adequate and high quality tissue. And you got to think and plan ahead about testing molecular markers.